in these trying times, we have to be innovative. We have to be creative. We have to look at ways in which, you know, what is it that I need to do to, to make sure my message is, is coming across or to make sure um, what I'm doing is having an impact on the communities that I serve. Many of us that are in the trenches, sometimes we don't always see that that's an opportunity or possibility. COVID hits in the midst of this crisis. We've got to scramble and to change what it is that we're doing. Our next presenter is, is um, I'm going to say he's a, a buddy of mine and, and somebody that I tremendously respect. Um, I have an opportunity to, to talk with him on occasion. I had an opportunity to go and tour, um, to be in his van. We deliver clothes to him. But to tell his story about what he's doing to make a difference, it then says, hey, there are things that we can always do. And there are those innovative, creative individuals that are out there. And, and one of those individuals is Mr. Daryl Dewberry. He says, um, my goal is to master the art of helping others, and I think he is well on his way to doing that. My focus is to help those persons that find themselves disenfranchised due to various disorders. I seek to assist a person with creating pathways to navigate themselves toward a desired quality of life accompanied by overall wellness. I delight in timely innovations that provide consistent intervention and support for those in need. At Abundant Community Recovery Services, we are among the industry leaders as it pertains to recovery housing, recovery supports, and mobile SUD services. Educated in Detroit Public Schools, California State University and Fresno undergrad, and Liberty University, I shall continue to strive for excellence and the quality of life for our communities. Mr. Daniels, Mr. Daryl Dewberry, welcome to our platform. Um, it's so good to see you, good buddy. Thank you, thank you. And good morning to everyone and welcome to the fifth annual Opioid Summit. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, the uh, Detroit Wayne Health Integrative Network for allowing me to share just a little bit of what we do to improve the quality of lives for people in our county. Uh, <clears throat> my focus today is harm reduction in high risk areas. And in order to understand what that means, we really need to understand what harm reduction is. Uh, harm reduction is, a, is an approach where the service delivery is not dependent upon a person being in treatment or stabilized in a treatment environment. Um, the service delivery is meeting the person where they are. Uh, so for us, we implement uh, a plan of action, uh, strategies that we can deploy to help improve the situation that the person finds themselves in at the time of engagement. Uh, for us, we provide these services on our mobile units. We have two mobile units that service all of Wayne County. Uh, one services the Detroit area, the other services our Wayne. Uh, and we provide these services on these mobile units. Uh, but there is a misconception uh, in regards to harm reduction. And uh, that misconception is, is that uh, harm reduction condones or encourages drug use. And this is simply not true. Um, there are situations where we go through a process in order to encourage individuals or help an individual find or identify a pathway to navigate themselves to ongoing recovery or overall abstinence. Uh, to do that, we use an, a, a process, a steps, uh, if you will. Um, we believe that, and I'm, I'm a true believer that there are many pathways to recovery. Um, and harm reduction is a tool that will help a person identify which pathway is best for them. Our targeted population for the mobile units are opioid users. Um, and we go to high risk areas where opioid users are engaged in the addiction culture. And we seek to service them in those environments. So when it comes to 
the harm reduction method. It's a method that seeks to reduce the harm in the overall footprint that we find ourselves servicing. That footprint doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we're only looking to help the person that's suffering from opioid usage. We're also looking to reduce the harm to the environment or the people in the footprint around them. That can mean family members. It can mean uh, significant others. It can mean the, the banker, the grocer, uh, the, the urgent care services, uh, the, the uh, first responders, police and fire. We're talking about everybody in the footprint is affected by the opioid or the addiction culture. Now, when we find a high risk area, when we identify a high risk area, what we are understanding is, is that all of these areas, these high risk areas are also products of a subculture. Now, some subcultures are welcoming. You know, we go in, we have resources, we have services, they engage us, they accept what we have to bring to them. Uh, and we're able to extract individuals out of these cultures and get them to the help that they need. That they need. Other subcultures are a little more difficult because they're tribalistic in nature. They have their own communication. They have their own rules and regulations. For instance, um, we find ourselves servicing the panhandler uh, culture. Now, in the panhandling culture, uh, we found that in one specific area uh, on Detroit's east side, there was a group of panhandlers that all lived together in one house. Uh, we saw a young lady that appeared to be, she looked young enough to be a minor. But after engaging this young lady, we found that she was 18 years of age, but she was totally engulfed in opioid dependency. Uh, we were able to speak to this young lady and provide necessary services at the time. The services that she required at the time was clean needles. You know, she really just needed clean needles and a hygiene kit. But that opened the door. That created the pathway for us to permeate or to get into the subculture to bring information to those individuals that were suffering. We later found that all of the panhandlers in that particular group or that particular subculture lived in one house. After numerous times of servicing the individuals that were in that panhandling culture, we were invited to bring some services to the house. When we were able to get to the house, we were able to talk to the alpha or the person that was the leader of this particular group and talk about how we could collaborate with them to help them to gain necessary services. Now, in the harm reductions, with the harm reduction strategy, the goal might initially be to reduce the method of use. So in other words, if you're an interven intravenous drug user, we try to encourage you to maybe snort or smoke, right? Now, some might say, well, that's encouraging drug use. Well, if we can reduce the severity, isn't that recovery? So we began to utilize these strategies, clean needles, uh, washing or rinsing out your syringes with, uh, with a clean wash, uh, reducing the individuals, the number of individuals that are uh, shooting drugs or taking them intravenously and uh, reducing that to a, a lower level of usage. Then from there we go to, hey, why don't you try not using on Sunday? You know, uh, take a day out to get some rest. We'll bring you, you know, some food and, and we'll deliver some services to you that will help you to get through that day. You know, and that day turns into two days. Two days turns to three days. And before you know it, a person is calling us and saying, hey, look, I just want to go to detox. I'm tired of this. I want to get out of this. And that is the strategy and the goals of the harm reduction method. So for this particular group of individuals, we were able to extract three people out and get them into detox. One, the young lady that I told you about, uh, she just recently, matter of fact, it was, I think it was yesterday, that young lady completed 
her C car training at the Detroit Recovery Project and now has her C car certification. This is a young lady that felt that it was hopeless for her, that she was going to die in active addiction. But we were able to reverse that thinking, to restore her thinking to something positive and to improve her quality of life. And now she's committed herself to helping others. This is a part of what we're faced with every day. Uh, I was asked a question in another interview uh, a short time ago as to what are we seeing now? What is the greatest um, hindrance or the, or the greatest factor or barrier to recovery or to engage individuals to uh, attract them to recovery? And the greatest thing that we see now as a hindrance or a barrier is fear. Fear has paralyzed our community. And it's even more so in the subcultures where opioid addiction is rampant. Because of or due to COVID and the, the fear of COVID, individuals that would normally maybe go to brick and mortar acute treatment programs or recovery programs are afraid to go because they think that because individuals have suffered in addiction cultures that they automatically are exposed to COVID or that they may have COVID or COVID might exist in these environments. So fear is paralyzing the decision making of individuals that are suffering from opioid addiction. One of the things that we've done to address these hindrances and barriers and to relieve the fear is to include COVID testing in the array of services that we offer. Now, our mobile units are considered to be uh, triage units. In other words, we deal with what we engage. So we engage an individual and the individual has been um, involved in or immersed in the addiction culture and they have a mental health diagnosis or misdiagnosis or undiagnosis and they haven't been taking their medication regimen, uh, we address that particular disparity at the time. If we see an individual and they're chronically homeless or they're suffering from some type of physical uh, disparity as a result of sleeping on the street, uh, we address what we engage at that time. This takes special training for our recovery coaches. Our recovery coaches are versatile. They can um, be diverse in their engagement with individuals that we see through outreach, through uh, servicing these subcultures and high risk areas. You know, they have to be able to identify what's primary, even though our purpose, our goal is to bring relief to those individuals that are suffering from opioid abuse. We have to be cognizant of the fact that they are co there are co-primary disorders that exist with these individuals. You know, some 20 odd years ago, when I first started working as a social worker, the average individual that walked into my office was maybe homeless, and had an SUD disorder. Today, the individual that I see or we engage on the street in these uh, high-risk environments is a person that has an SUD concern, a mental health concern, secondary illness such as HIV, diabetes, uh, they're chronically homeless, and they're victims of trauma. Five to six disorders are current with these individuals. And any of these disorders can be, or disparities can be co-primary. So as we go into the subcultures, we have to be able to engage individuals where they are. The harm reduction method is the best tool that we have been able to use to engage individuals where they are. It gives us the ability to go in <clears throat> and collaborate. 
we can go in, we can assess individuals, we can offer services, we can bring services directly to them. Uh, we can offer things such as uh, a clothing closets for individuals to and to change their clothes, or we offer a hot shower on the unit where they can come in and they can bathe. You know, all of these things give us a window of, of time where we can try to convince an individual to move towards quality of life or even consider it or even understand what it is. Uh, in our county, in Wayne County, we're finding that there is a consistent misunderstanding in terms of what's available. A lot of individuals that we see that are trapped in these subcultures, they really have given up hope. They don't really think that there's help out here for them. You know, so when we can take a mobile unit, a mobile care unit, and we can go places where individuals aren't necessarily going to come to us, and we can show them that we care, that there's an entity like Detroit Wayne Health Integrated Network that cares, that cares so much that they're putting wheels to the road to go where you are. We're coming to you. You don't have to come to us. You know, and we come to you on a regular basis to provide services necessary so that we can help individuals. One of the other things that has been remarkable for us is to, to understand how we can help the people around the people that are suffering. In these subcultures, there are a number of people that exist in these subcultures that aren't opioid users. There are people that are affected, affected by the people that they love. We've seen children, we've seen mothers that are trying to help their sons. We've seen fathers that are trying to help their daughters. We've seen concerned police. We've seen concerned uh, individuals from clinics and, and other support people that are just trying to help, but they are affected by the, the years that they spend involved in supporting and trying to help these individuals. Having the mobile units and being mobile and being able to go back and forth, to and fro, up and down Wayne County, to be consistent in our delivery of services has made a tremendous difference in the lives of those people that are struggling to try to help. Uh, just as the presenter before me talked about supporting and helping his son. There is an enormous amount of people that are trapped in the culture of addiction, trying to help their people get out. And we are very proud to say that we've been able to help individuals extract people out of these subcultures and put them into care where they can experience the renewal of life. So for us, uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful thing to be able to move and go to the suffering individuals and be able to provide a strategy that is shown to be consistent in helping individuals improve their lives. If it's just a meal, if it's just clothing, if it's just a hot shower, if it's just a clean syringe, you know, if it's just a conversation to be had on a regular basis every week that we drive back through a certain area, you know, these things encourage people to change the way that they think and believe about recovery. Our focus is to create pathways. Like I said, there are many pathways to recovery. The process of helping the individual navigate themselves to those pathways is our goal. It is our purpose. It is what we do. My focus is recovery, getting a person there, dealing with whatever we have to, training diversely, however we have to, to be able to address individuals where they are, to be able to uh, move and have a being in these subcultures and be able to be trusted to provide quality of care. 
For us, we will continue to address and move in a way that will help to extract and help to deplete the disparities that are killing the people that live in our county. Um, we are truly grateful to be able to have the mobile units and to be functional, to be able to move throughout Wayne County. There are subcultures that we didn't know exist, you know, such as uh, people that are families that are living under the viaducts in certain on our freeways, you know, and these are individuals where uh, they just don't have the money, you know, and, and, and the entire family is not uh, using substances. It might just be the father or the mother, but the situation of such that they don't have income. But we're able to help these individuals. We're able to bring services to them. We're able to meet them where they are. You know, this is the value of the method of harm reduction. To reduce the harm just enough so that a person can see the help coming and can see the value of making healthy decisions. It is extremely, extremely important that we train our staff and our, especially our recovery coaches to be diverse in their presentation, their understanding, their identification, and their implementa implementation of services to the individuals that we serve. Because again, the subcultures are tribalistic in tendency. They have uh, established themselves. They have a language of their own. And if you don't speak that language, you will not get in to help these individuals. It is imperative that we train ourselves to be able to engage people where they are so that we can help extract them from the jaws of active addiction and bring them into the process of recovery. And it, has, it hasn't failed over the years that I've been doing this to see that a person that usually comes into the process of recovery reaches back and brings someone with them. That is the strategy. That is the goal, to get as many people out of the quicksand of addiction into the firm ground of recovery as we can. So we are uh, engaging individuals using the harm reduction strategy uh, in high risk areas to be able to help our overall community live better. You know, we want to create an environment where we can talk about addiction, where we can identify addiction, and where we can uh, bring service to addiction when it's required. You know, treatment on demand, servicing and helping individuals when they want service and help is something that we pride ourselves on at Abundant Community. Uh, our mobile units has been a godsend to be able to get out on the road and go to where the suffering is so that we can pull as many people out to safety as we can. This is our work. This is our goal. This is our purpose. We will continue to do this as long as we have the power to do so. Again, I'm Daryl Duberry from Abundant Community Recovery Services. And just for the day, tell somebody that you care. Uh, try to relieve them of the fear of COVID and let them know that there are resources and we are here to help. Thank you. Daryl Dewberry, we love you. Um, I love you too, for, Doc. <laughs> thank you for being one of our homegrown heroes. Um, we've reached out to you. I know you're partnering with the, the health department and you're going to be training them on um, outreach and they've agreed to jump on the van with you. Uh, there's a comment that I, I, I just want to read it to you in its entirety. It says that I am amazed by everything the harm reduction mobile units are doing. Community-based harm reduction is the only approach that truly meets actively using drug users exactly where they are. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do. And I'm sure that's echoed throughout everybody who has been part of this presentation. It sounds like your harm reduction, I love what you said, is that you wanted to reduce the severity. To, so that they can engage in recovery. And yeah. it sounds like harm reduction is really that continuum to recovery. Um, we, we talk about those small steps that have to be taken and each one of those steps lead them more toward that recovery opportunity. 
how can organizations implement and grow their harm reduction strategies? Well, I think it comes through diverse training. <clears throat> it, it, it starts with understanding that the populations that you target to serve suffer from many disparities. And, and we need to understand that those disparities are co-primary. So when an individual is engaged, if they're just hungry, then feed them. And that will lead to what you're really trying to address. So I think diversity of training is the key. Being able to identify and recognize what the primary disparity is and being able to assist the person to address that concern. What you're doing is unconventional. What you're doing, other people are saying, I mean, you've already said, hey, you know, all you're doing is helping the addict by giving them clean needles or by, you know, giving them food and things like that. And I think we, we heard earlier from um, our sheriff who, who talked about alternative approaches, who said mm -hmm. that, that these things can make a difference. Can you talk about some of your outcomes and, and uh, the, the kinds of data that, that drives more resources your way? Okay. Well, one of the things that I did mention in the presentation was our strategy to have naloxone in the area. So what we do is, is that we go in and we engage individuals, we explain to them how naloxone can save or reverse an overdose. And we tell them, okay, well, just, just take a few of these kids and keep them around. And if somebody should have an overdose, then you can help them or save their lives. With that particular strategy, we've had over 50 to 60 saves. Just because help is available in the environment. You know, for, for us, that's an innovation that has been key, is being able to convince people to that there is a way to save your life. And, and that way exists in this small kit that just keep it around. And that's been one of the major things that we've done is to implement naloxone into the addictive culture and have it sit there like in the Trojan horse, you know, where it's hidden and it comes out at the time of disparity and it saves the life. That's been, it's made a remarkable difference in saving the lives of individuals that we service. When we can help Mr. Dewberry, because one of the things that we have found out and the data is clearly showing us is that many of you have been trained in, and D Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network has really done a concerted effort to get out there and to train individuals and, yes. and to distribute Narcan. And so some of you have been trained last year and your Narcan may have expired. We're asking you, please don't throw it away. Get it to Mr. Dewberry yes. uh, because it can still be used. It can be used in an opportunity. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to get those those that Narcan replaced. So please, you know, Mr. Dewberry, thank you. Again, one of our homegrown heroes. Um, we we are so appreciative of what you're doing and everything that you're doing is making a difference. So with thank that, you. we thank you for being here. We thank you for the work that you do and just keep up the good work. Thank you, Doc. See you soon. All righty. Wow. Um, and we, we've heard some remarkable presentations. You know, we're, your call to action is to, one, understand, to educate, and to advocate. And, and then part of that pro process, I think Mr. Dewberry pointed out quite well, is that you got to understand what's going on, and you've got to learn, and you've got to educate yourselves about opportunities and challenges and things that we can do individually and as organizations.